well guys i'll have to start another new book and uh, without finishing all the other books i'm already reading especially in my personal life and as well as in the channel that's because pitrupaksh has started we are in the middle of it and the great bb lal just passed away a few days back and if you want to know who he is and how great he is you'll have to google them because i'm not going to uh, get into that because that's going to be a hu- huge video in itself his contributions to india and indian history maybe i'll get into some that some day but today i'm going to just start discussing this book in in various parts this book is called the rigvedic people and uh, invaders or immigrants or indigenous who are the rigvedic people evidence of archaeology and literature let's start reading this book and let's see what he has written i have uh, gone through uh, the preface a bit and uh, i have noticed that even that's very important and i i am going to go through this book uh you know, while putting all other books on hold because i have to return to this return this book to a friend uh, she wants it back and also it's pitrupaksha and bibilal has just passed away that's why these are the three reasons i'm holding off other books and reading this now it's dedicated to the sacred memory of sri aurobindo and swami vivekanand who long ago affirmed that the rigvedic people were indigenous and not invaders in the preface he says isn't it an occasion to congratulate the national council of educational research and training ncert a government of india organization which is entrusted with the task of preparing textbooks for school going children to have finally come out of its shell and admit that the theory of aryan invasion of india is untenable and where have they done that they have done it in the textbook in history for class 12 under themes in indian history part 1 new delhi january 2010 page 18 but the ingrained mindset for resisting the whole truth persists as reflected by the following statement on page 28 of the same book it says quote There were several developments in different parts of the subcontinent during the long span of the of 1500 years following the end of the Harappan civilization. This was also the time during which the Rig Veda was composed by people living along the Indus and its tributaries. End quote. The Rig Veda refers to the river Saraswati a number of times, which means that it was an active river during that period. Combined evidence of archaeology, radiocarbon method of dating Uh, hydrology and other allied sciences has uh, has established that the saraswati dried up around 2000 bce thus the rigveda has got to be earlier than 2000 bce how much earlier it is anybody's guess however at least a third millennium bce horizon is indicated because a river doesn't dry up one fine morning it has to gradually 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 dry up and the rigveda says that it's, it's a voluptuous full of water and it's like a mother carrying milk that kind of a river is saraswati i had presented the above mentioned view long ago uh, in 2005 but it is a pity that ncert has consciously ignored it may it be hoped that it makes amends even now there is yet another aspect which needs to be highlighted the rigveda also gives a very good idea of the territory occupied by the rigvedic people verses 5 and 6 of sukta 75 of mandala 10 refer to the entire area lying between the ganga yamuna on the east and the indus and its western tributaries on the west it was this very idea that was occupied by the harappan civilization during the 3rd millennium bce vis-a-vis the time of the rigveda clearly therefore the harappans are none other than the vedic people themselves further C14 dates for Bhirana a site in the upper Saraswati valley show that the roots of the Harappan civilization go back to the 6th and 5th millennia BCE which implies that the Harappans slash Vedic people were deeply rooted in the Indian soil to call them aliens is a sheer travesty of truth how long shall we continue to blindfold ourselves now a post script for the preface There are quite a few subtopics related to the main topic of this book and I would like the reader to know my views on the same. Hence I have added at the end a few appendices 
uh, okay now he mentions appendices the late professor posel in a recent paper criticized my identification of certain features at kalibangan as fire altars he calls them cooking hearths which to my mind is basically wrong appendix 2 deals with the issue much hue and cry is made uh, that there are fundamental differences between the harappan civilization and the culture depicted in the vedas this stand is incorrect and is the subject matter of appendix 3 okay we'll have to read the appendix then finally the late sir mortimer wheeler had declared in 1947 that there was an ultimate extinction of the harappan civilization which we have been taught in school the fact of the matter is that while the urban characteristics of this civilization began to disappear for various reasons around 2000 bce the basic elements of the culture continued and are discernible even today in the life of rural india even like in rakhigarhi which accounts for more than 90% of the population this is the subject matter of appendix 4 okay this is the first book where i'm going to read the appendix this uh, he wrote in on vijayadashmi october 3 2014 bb lal now let's get into the <clears throat> introduction introductory chapter 1 the sanskrit language whatever be its antiquity is of a wonderful structure more perfect than the greek more copious than latin and more exquisitely refined than either yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity both in roots of verbs and in the forms of grammar than could possibly have been produced by accident and it's refined that's why it's called sanskrit sanskrit means a refined sanskrit the word sanskrit jiska sanskaran hua hai that means it's refined so strong indeed that no philosopher could examine them them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source meaning all those three languages greek latin and sanskrit without believing them to have sp- uh, sprung from some common source which perhaps no longer exists there is a similar reason though not quite so forcible for supposing that both the gothic and the celtic though blended with a very different idiom had the same origin with the sanskrit and the old persian might be added to the same family if this were the place for discussing any question concerning the antiquities of persia this was said by sir william jones a calcutta high court judge delivering the third anniversary discourse to the bengal branch of the royal asiatic society on february 2 1786 this startling pronouncement in the field of linguistics had far reaching implications for the history of the peoples of asia and europe and uh, as far as i remember uh, sir william jones is probably the founder of asiatic society and i think he he started this idea of indology i think i might be wrong the revelation that there were close similarities in languages from india on the east to europe on the west at uh, once led to the concept of an indo-european family of languages further looking for the origins as we are always prone to do there came up the idea of a proto-indo-european language from which all these languages must have gradually emerged it was thereafter argued that since languages cannot spread without their carriers namely the people there must have be, must have been a proto-indo-european race Finally as might be expected there began the hunt for the original home or your arhatmat of these proto-indo-europeans the rigvedic people who are classified under this schema as indo-aryans were thought to have come to india from their quote unquote original home located elsewhere and here is a little bit of history on the research for this arhatmat although the he, he gives a footnote here Although the terms proto-indo-european, indo-european and indo-aryan have long been used in a racial sense, it is now realized that a racial connotation is faulty. Linguistic similarities need not necessarily imply a singularity of race. For the very simple reason that the earliest known text amongst these indo-european languages was the Rigveda, it was as a natural corollary thought by many Indian as well as foreign scholars that India must have been the original home of the Indo-European people and here i quote two very eminent indian intellectuals of the 20th century who argued that there was no basis for holding the vedic people uh, holding that the vedic people came from the outside namely sri aurobindo and swami vivekanand observed uh, the former uh, in 1971 sri aurobindo says 
The indications in the Veda on which this theory of a recent Aryan invasion is built are very scanty in the quantity and uncertain in significance. There is actually no mention of any such invasion. Likewise, Swami Vivekananda with some anguish stated, And what your European pundits say about the Aryans swooping down from some foreign land, snatching away the lands of the aborigines and settling in India by exterminating them is pure nonsense, foolish talk. In what Veda, in what Sukta do you find that the Aryans came to India from a foreign country? Where do you get the idea that they slaughtered the wild aborigines? What do you gain by talking such nonsense? Strange that our Indian scholars too say Amen to them and all these monstrous lies are being taught to our boys. So Vivekanand said this in 1970 and uh, I guess, yeah, 70 to 73. At least it, whatever the book, it was published in 70 to 73, yeah. And uh, people still believe this nonsense. But for various reasons, which may also have had some political overtones, the Indian homeland hypothesis was soon abandoned and European pride came to the fore. The European rat race was so profound that almost every part thereof, Scandinavia, Southwest Russia, Finland, Germany, Hungary, etc., advanced its own claims for the Urheitmat. However, in the end, the Europeans themselves became so much disenchanted that a renowned scholar, Jean-Paul de Mole, 1980, page 120, uh, I don't know what the 120 is for, was led to make a very sarcastic remark. He says, quote, We have seen that one primarily places the Indo-Europeans in the north if one is German, in the east if one is Russian, and in the middle if, if being Italian or Spanish. One has no chance of completing, competing for the privilege. In the course of time, many non-European claims were made. The more noteworthy amongst which are those relating to the Anatolian region in Western Asia, the Black Sea Caspian Sea, the Black Sea Caspian Sea Belt, the steppes of Southern Russia, and the most recent one, Sogdiana in, in South Central Asia. Although it is not possible in this book to offer detailed comments on each of one of the foregoing claims, it nevertheless seems necessary to show, however, briefly, their intrinsic flaws. Holding that the Proto-Indo-European stage, these people were no longer nomads but had become settled agriculturists, agriculturalists, some scholars with, uh, with Colin Renfrew, Renfrew in the forefront, uh, this scholar called Colin Renfrew was leading this idea, they look to Anatolia as the homeland, the date for identification being around 7000 BCE. With this as the Arhatmat, they hold that one branch moved westwards and entered Europe, another branch faced eastwards and moving along the sou southern littoral of the Black Sea Caspian Sea, entered Afghanistan and thence the Indian subcontinent. In a slightly modified version, it is stated that the splitting took that the splitting took place after reaching Europe. <clears throat> in which scenario, some people stayed on in Europe, while others moved eastwards and passing through the territory lying on the north of the Black Sea and Caspian Sea, found their ultimate destinations in Iran, Afghanistan, and India. However, there are some inherent flaws in the foregoing thesis. First. If these Anatolian Proto-Indo-Europeans had reached the level of agricultural economy, one expects that the agriculture-related terms would have been shared by the various subsequent branches. This, however, is not the case. Commenting on this agricultural aspect, Lambert Karlovsky uh, does not hesitate to remark that, quote, the whole issue has been simplified by Professor Renfrew to the ludicrous formula 7000 BCE is equal to uh, farming Indo-Europeans, end quote. Secondly, the language used in the well-known uh, Bogaskoy Treaty, the language used in the well-known Bogaskoy Treaty and in other allied documents on the basis of which the presence of the Indo-Europeans in Anatolia has been perceived, was only a quote-unquote superstratum language in the region used by the rulers and elites and not the substratum one. This would at once imply that the Indo-Europeans were not the quote-unquote sons of the soil in Anatolia. Gamkrelidze and Ivanov in 1995 uh, are of the view that the area between Black Sea and the Caspian Sea was the Arhatmat of the uh, Indo-Europeans. Arhatmat is spelled U-R-H-E-I-T-M-A-T. They were of the uh, opinion that Arhatmat uh, was the region between Black Sea and Caspian Sea. Using linguistic paleontology, 
as their main tool, they argue that the perceived homeland was a mountainous region full of lakes and rivers. And since this particular region fits into such a mold, it must have been the homeland. This, however, does not seem to be a very compelling kind of argument, since there could be many other regions footing the bill. On the other hand, there is a very strong argument that goes counter to the Black Sea Caspian Sea hypothesis. The language spoken in that area is replete with non-Indo-European words, indicating that there was a predominantly non-Indo-European element over there, which formed the substratum. Hence, the claim that the original inhabitants of the Black Sea Caspian Sea belt were Proto-Indo-Europeans does not stand the scrutiny. There is yet another region regarding which tall claims have been made as being the Arhaitmat vis-a-vis the steppes located to the north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Maria Gimbutas, uh, 1966 and 1997 amongst others, holds that the Kurgan culture, Kurg, Kurgan culture of this area, characterized by burials in barrows, represents the original Indo-Europeans. According to her, the Indo-Europeans were warriors who rode horses and used thrusting weapons and could thus easily conquer new areas. With this twofold capacity, she argues, they overran Central Europe around 5th and 4th millennia BCE. However, Renfrew has shown that mounted warriors appeared in Central Europe only as late as the 2nd to 1st millennia BCE. Thus, Gimbutas' theory gets floored on account of this contra- contrast. From another angle too, this theory does not stand a scrutiny. Catherine Krell in 1998, using linguistic tools, demonstrates that the Indo-Europeans had reached an agricultural stage, whereas the Kurgan people were essentially pastoral. Hence, the intrinsic weakness of the thesis vis-a-vis Kurgan culture is equal to Indo-Europeans, so-called. The latest amongst the claims in search for the Arhaitmat is the one made by Nicholas, 1997. Uh, She holds that the Nichols, not Nicholas, Nichols, someone called Nichols. She holds that the dispersal of the Indo-European languages, she holds that the dispersal of the Indo-European languages commenced from a region somewhere in the vicinity of ancient Bactria Sogdiana, thus bringing the scenario closer to the Indian subcontinent, but not quite there. However, an important postulate in Nichols' thesis is that it was only the language that got dispersed and not the people. The details of this language dispersion in Nicole's thesis are that in the first lap it reached the Caspian region via the Aral Sea. Around the Caspian region there was a bifurcation, one trajectory being along the north of the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, and from there westwards to Europe, and the other along the, sea, along the south of these seas, reaching Anatolia and thence Europe. This thesis, however, remains to be duly evaluated. In a rather sarcastic comment, Mallory once said, One does not ask, quote, One does not ask, where is the Indian European homeland? But rather, where do they put it now? (laughs) Because everyone keeps changing it. Now we may once again re-examine the Indian homeland thesis, which was advanced by many a scholar at the very beginning of the debate a couple of centuries ago but which was overruled in favour of other areas like Europe, Anatolia, Black Sea, Caspian Sea, Littoral, Central Asia, etc. as discussed in the preceding pages. The reopening, uh, the reopening the Indian homeland issue may it, uh, may, it be, may it be made absolutely clear is not because of any chauvinistic reasons as some perennial critics would like to imagine, but because whereas two centuries ago there was no archaeological data to back up this theory, there is plentiful of it now which makes it obligatory on the part of scholars at least to rethink. However, before taking up a detailed analysis of the issues, based on the everyday piling up archaeological data on the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, it would be interesting to have a look at at how the antiquity of Indian civilization was viewed in not too distant a past. Thus, in his book, The Cambridge History of India, Volume 1, published in 1921, Sir John Marshall, the, the distinguished Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India, expressed the view that for all practical purposes, the history of India began after the invasion of Alexander the Great in 326 BC, giving giving a somewhat reluctant nod to the fact that the Cyclopean walls at Rajgir, ancient Rajgriha in Bihar, may go back to the 6th century BCE, 
and that was all. Little did this archaeologist realize that in the very year of the publication of his tome, one of his own officers in the survey, namely Rai Bahadur Dayaram Sahani, had bought to had brought to light the remains of a civilization which threw back in a single stroke the antiquity of civilization on the subcontinent to the third millennium BCE. This was at Harappa in Montgomery, now called Sahiwal district in Pakistan's Punjab. Hardly within a year, 1922, the feat of Dayaram Sahani was redu reduplicated by another of his colleagues, Rakhal Dash Banerjee, at Mohenjo-daro in Larkana district, Sindh. These preliminary discoveries were followed up by large-scale excavations at Mohenjo-daro, first under the overall direction of Sir John Marshall himself, and later by E. J. H. Mackay. Likewise, the site of Harappa was treated to major uh, operations by Pandit Madho Sarup Vats in 1940. <coughs> These discoveries produced the evidence of their having existed in the northwestern part of the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, a civilization, which was not only contemporary with the well-known civilizations of Egypt and Mesopotamia, but in some ways, spatially as well as qualitatively, even excelled them. The area covered by this civilization, going today by various names such as Harappa civilization, Indus civilization and Indus Saraswati civilization, was as much as, if not more than, the area covered jointly by the Egyptian and Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian civilizations. But indeed, the extent is not so much a point that deems to be highlighted as, highlighted as are certain other features of the Harappan civilization. The size does not matter, Bibilal is saying. For example, Whereas neither the Egyptian nor the Mesopotamian civilization could boast of town planning, the Harappan civilization could. The Harappan cities were systematically laid out, the streets being oriented al along the cardinal directions, that is north, south, east, west. In fact, the recent excavation at Kalibangan and uh, have uh, Kalibangan have shown that even the widths of the streets were in a set ratio of one is to two is to three is to four actually measuring 1.8 meters, 3.6 meters, 5.4 meters and 7.2 meters respectively. An elaborate system of underground drainage characterized Mohenjo-daro, something lacking in contemporary Egypt and Mesopotamia. Further, the metropolitan settlements such as those at Mohenjo-daro and Harappa and the ones excavated in India after the partition of 1947 vis-a-vis -vis at Kalibangan, Dholavira etc. and to, to this day to Rakhigari etc had at least two components, a relatively smaller one named by archaeologists as the citadel, meant for the elites, elites, priests and rulers, and a bigger one called the lower town, inhabited by the commoners. It has been found that the former was invariably fortified within which there lay many important buildings like a granary, a bath complex and platforms carrying on them religious structures of various denominations. Quite often, the lower town was also provided with a fortification wall. Further, the use of kiln-fired bricks made in a set of set proportion of 4 is to 2 is to 1, namely 40 cm by 2 cm, 20 cm by 10 cm or 30 cm by 15 cm by 7.5 cm was another feature that made the Harappan towns stand apart from their western counterparts. Though the Harappan civilization cannot boast of large-sized sculptures as can the Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations, this may perhaps have been due to the non-availability of stone in the alluvial Indus and Saraswati plains. The Harappan statu uh, statuary is by no means of a lower order. Though tiny, the famous bronze figure of a dancing girl who stands like this from Mohenjo-daro with an exotic pose arms uh, bedecked with bangles, a stylish hairdo, a somewhat haughty expression, not H-O-T-T-Y, H-A-U-G-H-T-Y, somewhat haughty expression on the face and a necklace dangling between the breasts is indeed a memorable piece of art. So what if they didn't build pyramids? Or take the engraved seals of steatite, though meant to be used for a more mundane purpose of stamping packages containing commodities for export. The animals featuring on them are really marvellous. Indeed, no engraving from ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia can match the nuances of the zebu, with its swinging dewlap, well-proportioned muscular body, 
long and curved horns, and a face beaming with force and vitality, all finished exquisitely and to the minutest details. As might be expected, soon after the discovery of this civilization began the debate for its origin. Since there was already a set frame of mind, at least in the 1920s, that India was incapable of giving birth to such a magnificent civilization, its percentage had perforce to be traced outside India. Hona hi hoga. India ke andar definitely nahi hai. That was the preset presumption. Like uh, everyone thinks that nothing has Vedic roots. If if some BJP leader says something has Vedic roots, people laugh at them. Even not with, without reading any any Indian history, without reading any any Vedic texts. They are sure that absolutely zero, absolutely nothing in the world today that we see has Vedic roots. So that was the emotions in 1920s as well. So definitely, kisi or ne banaya hoga. And since a settled uh, civilization was readily available in Mesopotamia, it was assumed that this Indian civilization originated from that of Mesopotamia. When the proponents of such a thesis were asked to pinpoint which of the elements of the Harappan civilization originated from their respective counterparts in Mesopotamia, these scholars naturally fumbled, since there was nothing to support such a stand. Then came the next move, namely, even if there were no objects to demonstrate the origin or even borrowing, at least the idea of civilization may have come from Mesopotamia. They flashed out, ideas have wings. We have thus three very specific questions to deal with, namely, one, whether the so-called Aryans, Indo-Aryans, that is, the Rig Vedic people came to India from outside as invaders or immigrants, or they were indigenous. Two, whether the Harappan civilization was also intrusive or it grew up on the Indian soil. And three, whether the Harappan civilization and the Vedas are but two faces of the same coin. In the following pages, we shall try to answer these questions one by one.